And the reason for you and your sister's loss of... Um... Shall I say... Purity as angels, Lady Michiru? My, my, Master Lyle. You have quite an inquisitive nature, don't you? I... I apologize. As a scholar, it has always been one of my undesirable habits. Oh boy, we come to this point in the game. Well, first off, some good news. We have the opportunity to save the game or continue the scene. But this moment here... This moment here is very important for future reference. It involves that point in the game later on when I kind of, um, blew up. So let us kind of keep this in mind. We're in the middle of this cutscene, and we have the option of saving the game or continuing the scene. Would any of you wish to retire also? <sighs> this is it. This is where the end of my first attempt playing the game happened. Okay. Let us set the stage for what happened the first time I was playing. As I explained before, I was feeling really overworked at the time. I was doing way too many projects at once, including lots of editing. And you can tell I was feeling overworked because it was affecting my enjoyment of this game. I was not enjoying it as much as I have during this playthrough. And so we get to this point. It was actually possibly a similar situation as to now. I was hoping for a save point. I have not had the opportunity to save since fighting Gorgon. And then we come to this blank screen with these two options. And I've thought, huh, okay, maybe this is like that other time where I had the option to save in the middle of a cutscene. I can go ahead and save and then come back to this later on and continue the cutscene. No. This top option right here will skip the rest of the cutscene. In fact, I'm going to unhighlight it right now so I don't accidentally click it. Uh, when I found out that I accidentally skipped the rest of the cutscene, I was furious. I didn't want to skip the rest of the cutscene. Why were you giving me that option? And if I wanted to try again and reload my save so that I could see the, the cutscene that I skipped, that would mean having to refight Gorgon. Uh, and I was so angry and making such a stink about it. I wound up insulting one of the game creators, calling him dumb. And that was the end of that playthrough. How could I continue the playthrough after overreacting like that and insulting Atlantis. And once again, Atlantis, I apologize. To say that I overreacted is an understatement. That said, I think this decision is really weird. This choice that I have it's not worth overreacting to, but it is definitely weird, because as far as I'm aware, this is the only time in the game that we have the option to skip a cutscene. And we are already over 30 hours into this game. And I do have to question, why is this an option in, in the first place? Maybe so that the player can quickly get through this rest of the cutscene and have a chance to save? But if that's the case, why not just offer the chance to save? Again, this is not worth getting angry over, but it is kind of weird. 
That said, given that this was the point that my original playthrough ended, that means from this point on, we are going blind. I have no idea what's going to happen at this point. So, when we last left off, we were rescued by some red-headed girl who is apparently a dwarf from Elvenia, the other world that is a sister planet to Earth. Apparently, whenever the Dark Lord wound up going from Earth to Elvenia, he destroyed this dwarven girl's kingdom, she's the princess, and sent her back to Earth, along with her guardian angel, who she is married to. Okay, now that I say that out loud, the idea of being married to your guardian angel sounds really awesome. I would totally like to do that, and perhaps also ask for some possible transformative favors from the angel in order to make the arrangement possibly a little more comfortable for my end. If you know what I mean. And if you don't know what I mean, then don't dwell it on it too much. We'll just go ahead and continue the cutscene. Can you tell us more? And there was a brief moment of music before it quickly quieted down. I think the issue is that in Operation Maker 1, it's kind of hard to make it so that the music starts quiet. At least in the middle of a cutscene. So, that explains it. Wait, explains the what? Did, did we skip the explanation? Well, Serena's Bells, man. Addison's story does not explain much at all. Lynn interrupts. In a interesting way of swearing, we are being influenced against our wills by the people of Alvinia in more ways than one. Ugh. Serena's Bells. You know, I don't know that I will actually use that as a swearing substitute, but I will keep it in mind. What I'm saying is, if Madison and Rupert have some answers to things that might be important to us because they were involved with Elvenia's enemy from the beginning, then I don't care how little sleep I get tonight in order to get things straight. For one, who are the Lunas Elver Knights anyway? If no sort of evil ever existed in Elvenia before the time Lisa was supposed to have fought him, then they must have come from another world, or Anther world, as well as... Bleh. Typo threw me off. Then they must have come from Anther World as well, like the Dark Lord. Second, how is it that we never before heard of this story of an in about an entire kingdom being destroyed by an evil force until now? None of the Elvenians we've met ever mention it, but something like that surely would have shaken them to the core. You have a way with understatements, kid. And, most of all, how is it that anyone could have traveled between the Earth and Elvenia, voluntarily or otherwise? First, there was Madison and the Dark Lord, the Lunas Elver Knights, who must have had to enter the Path of Eden to search for Xenobia in the first place, and Grandis, who came to Magnolia and took us back with him on the day that this whole mess started. And yet, why is it that when we chose to go back to Earth after saving Kalinka, we needed those stupid magical earrings to be able to do anything. So, what gives? This Is this a matter of plot convenience? Or is there actually an explanation? Actually, I think I can answer one of those questions. Oh, that's right. Dusk, what we overheard from Gorgon a couple weeks ago when we were trying to escape Macross Islands. Yes. Ares and I heard Gorgon himself admit that he and the other Lunas Elver Knights are creatures of Elvenia themselves. Or rather, they are fallen Elvenians who refuse to see themselves as children of light. Of course, we do not yet have the foggiest idea if we have even met all of the Knights on this journey for sure, but one thing is for certain, they are not demons from beyond like so many monsters we've encountered in Elvenia are. 
Were any of you not aware of these things already, my esteemed soulless Emzu angels? As celestial beings, you would think we'd know a lot concerning this centuries-long struggle between Serena and the dragon, my dear. Hold on. Have we been told that uh, the devil is a dragon yet? That is unfortunate. But we really are no more the wiser than the two-legged Elvenians on most things. We had pretty much guessed that the Lunas Elru Nice had arisen straight from the Abyss itself, except for the man named Zealus Arden, who we always knew to have been a human. It's been a while since that guy has been mentioned. The one who wound up blinding Machiru. Was... wait, was Zealus... the guy who one of the angels had been connected to that was all sad and stuff about talking about and to tell the truth not even we were aware that teal cloud had actually been destroyed either at first in fact magica had been so prominent among the doors of central aquaville in the old days and the floating tower of rosa cloud where the dark lord now makes his home had at first looked so similar in appearance to madison's former kingdom that all of the elvenians must have simply guessed that the inhabitants had used their magic to reform the kingdom nothing more no one from the outside had missed poor madison her family and its servants either for hardly anyone in Teal Cloud ever left its boundaries. The Dark Lord had somehow done a very good job of making everyone think that Teal Cloud still stood, and that there was no strange scent of evil about it. This had troubled us for a very long time when we'd finally found the lost dead of Teal wandering the fringes of the heavens. The lost dead of Teal among the heavens? And yet, this entire time, Madison and Rupert had been stranded all the way out here in this world, and everyone else in the kingdom had died. No wonder my tale had been such a shock to you, my goddesses. But I myself cannot tell you that your ignorance of what happened was due to the explanation you offered, as I have been stuck on Earth ever since. But... The Dark Lord himself. How could his presence have gone completely unnoticed all that time? We already know that nearly everyone in Elvenia, especially the Solus Emsu Angels, are extraordinarily sensitive to any manner of evil, let alone Zenobia. I don't believe this. I'm starting to talk just like them. I mean, practically every time the name of the Dark Lord is mentioned, we can literally feel your for. We can literally feel you four angels break into a cold sweat. That must have been... Yes, the time when Madison and Rupert were sent to Earth could only have been when the Lord of Darkness just discovered the Path of Eden, and the knights, as Dusk and myself had Gorgon say... As Dusk and myself heard Gorgon say, had led him to Alvania. This is rather complicated to try to explain, but I can only assume that at first, Zenobia's presence in Earth's sister world could not be a very tangible one. In order to keep his physical body stable, he had undoubtedly been forced to, with the substance of his newly adopted servants, the Lunas Elru Knights, make many journeys between the Earth and Elvenia over the course of the first few years since Medicine's vanishing, as they began making their heinous plans. You see, if Zenobia, whoever he was before he became the Dark Lord, was a man who not only swore himself to the darkness, but became the great dragon's representative in the physical world, then, considering what kind of world Elvenia is, And considering how close one comes to the Endless White when journeying across Eden, 
the Dark Lord's ability to sustain a physical form in Elvenia would be terribly hindered until he had grown strong enough in his evil magic to come and go as he pleased across Eden, and he and the Lunas Elrun Nice had come far enough along in their plans for world damnation. I find it hard to believe that even Zenobia, at the very beginning anyway, could have been powerful enough to pull off an act as grandiose as destroying and reshaping Madison's entire kingdom in so little time. He must have had the help of the knights, who had all apparently held a grudge against Elvenia for a much longer time than we realize, and thus probably were already quite skilled in magic. Okay, I'm 30 minutes over time and definitely starting to feel worn down now. Also, we are learning here that the Dark Lord and some evil dragon are two separate beings. There is a trailer for this game that mentions that there is this dark dragon, but throughout the game itself, I don't remember whether it specifically mentioned that there was this dark dragon. They are just growing stronger and stronger too. And I am feeling that the Goddess of Fate is beginning to disappear from Elvenia altogether, just as she long ago had vanished from the hearts of the people of this world. It isn't just magic in the hands of Serena's children and her angels that is fading, as Miss Tessera had told us, but faith in their hearts also. In the Elvenians as well as in the hearts of the few Earthlings who might ever have sought for Serena, and that is perhaps the foremost reason why Zenobia Sephiroth and his acolytes are providing such dangerous adversaries to us. Yes. So, what Ares theoretically or what Ares theorized on basically explains my third question, too, of why the goddesses and us for Earthlings needed to possess a special means of traveling across Eden. Well, it seemed that all our enemies had to do was simply use magic at the appropriate place in order to make that trip. Otherwise, I guess Gorgon and the others would not have dared to risk trapping themselves in this world in the event that we were able to steal the earrings from them. Eh? No wonder Grandis gave up so easily when he'd first attacked our house in Magnolia. At his level of magic at the time, he may have already lost a lot of strength traveling across Eden in the first place, and he obviously needed to reserve a lot of magical power to make it back to Elvenia and take us along with him. Madison smiles cutely. So glad to see that many things pre previously misunderstood are now being brought into light with you all. Yeah, actually, kinda. When you mentioned the Endless White a moment ago, Miss Ares, can I assume that it is sort of like the holiest sanctum above the universe where Serena looks out over her creation? Hehe, <laughs> why yes, child, very perceptive of you. As you might have been able to guess, this was also the place where the Great Dragon's first truly malicious act against his longtime nemesis, Serena, had occurred about four years ago, when he'd become powerful enough to be able to ascend all the way up to the heavens and tear away the precious gift we angels had given to her directly from her with his own hands. I think it was meant to be a personal affront. The birthplace of you and the other angels, I take it? And perhaps everything else the Serena ever created? In a sense, yes. But the way you spoke it, Ares, I assume that the Endless White lies somewhere along the path of Eden, between Earth and Elvenia. That is... different from Heaven, right? Not at all, child. Serena's place of slumber and vigilance does lie on the path, but it is more above both of her worlds rather than between them. The heavens encompass the stars above and between our worlds after all. 
and the soul of every creature, aside from those born in the abyss, descends from the endless white as a luminescent star somewhat into the mortal world below and comes to rest within the blessed womb of the mother. Ah, huh, that sounds fun. How poetic, Sister Ares. You really are just like I had remembered. Tiki, <laughs> thank you, brother. Yawn. Well, we've been talking for quite a while, and if it is all right with our hosts, I discovered just way too many amazing things already in this one day to keep me awake for most of the night. Think nothing of it, sir. You all have been through quite a lot today, and young heroes do need their rest. And also, young spotted skunk dragon girls like myself. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot I personally would like to reflect on from today, and it is getting late enough as it is. Oh, Ari, I realize this is a bit inconsiderate on my behalf, but there are some things I really wish to talk with you in particular about before you retire, if you would be so kind as to try to keep your eyes open a little longer, solely for my sake. Can we have a save point first? With me? Well, sure, I guess, if you feel it is important. I probably won't actually be able to fall asleep for a long time anyway. With a healthy fear of Gorgon's finding us again still nipping at the heels. Thank you for your trouble. 